problems to solve. We have more complex well geometry. We have more complex fracture geometry. We've got multi-phase flow in the reservoir. Much more complicated thing. Uh, I, I did a, a one Petro search and just plotted in Excel, you know, how many times RTA was a keyword in an abstract or a title. And um, as you can see, it really starts to blow up after, you know, about 2012, 2013. And, um, you know, that there, that's probably no coincidence that that's the age of unconventionals. That's where people started really using RTA. The, the idea of having a well-performance analyst or an RTA engineer started to take to take hold. And that's still the case today. It's a it's a it's a um, fundamental skill that, you know, reservoir engineers of today have have to have. And there's lots of people doing lots of work on it. Um, all right. So. The RTA advancements driven by drilling, completion technology, liquids rich, high pressure, high temperature. Some of the things, I, uh, I'll just put them up all, all on the screen. These are things that you folks have been you know, doing and we've seen in the Whitson software, we've seen in, in the examples that are presented today. So we don't need to um, relive all those, but there, there's, a, there's a whole number of these different methods and things have become much more complex. Um, here's just a couple of examples of things that I've done uh, using some different, a little bit more antiquated software. Um, this is completion effectiveness. Uh, this is fracture characterization. So both of these come as a result of looking at lots of data, uh, doing some of the same sorts of workflows that we've seen today. And some of the observations I have just sort of overall, you know, if we take all of this stuff in context, um, ENPs with asset teams, uh, uh, asset team organizational structure have really embraced RTA as a as a common uh, framework for inter inter, inter easy for me to say interdisciplinary planning and strategy. It's a common language. The completion engineers now talk to the reservoir engineers using this concept of RTA. Everybody talks about a root k, right, or LFP linear flow parameter. That's a number that we can um, multi in a multidisciplinary way we can talk in multiple groups about that. RTA has become I would say less intuitive as a result of the reservoirs getting more complex. So as we move into these like fancy numerical models, it's harder to understand what's actually going on. So yes, there's better software, there's improved computational efficiency, it's made analysis easier and easier. Um, there's, I wanna caution you that it's not all sort of smiles and sunshine. There's a, there's a danger here, right? With things being really easy and you're getting like this, you know, serotonin rush in your brain when you get do an analysis and everything looks great and you're happy about it um you're not you you might be missing something right so i think um engineers are this is my sort of general statement for my observations engineers these days are analyzing more data they've got more tools they've got better access to tools um, but they're not learning as much necessarily right so so one of i said at the beginning of the um talk you know i'm not going to predict the future but one thing I think will not change is that fundamentals will always be important, right? We always have to make sure as engineers, and if we're mentors training junior engineers that we have this really solid understanding of the fundamentals and, what, and what's going on. There's never gonna be a replacement for that. And if you're using advanced software and not learning the fundamentals, then that can be obviously be a big problem. So that brings me to my little shameless commercial plug Matthias and I have a little agreement. We have like a quid pro quo. So he comes to my conference or sends someone to my conference and uh, they plug the Whitson software and I do the same thing and come to Whitcon and, and, and plug my uh, subscription service. So uh, I work for uh, uh, Saga Wisdom. We are a web-based learning platform. Um, many of you in the room have, have heard of us. Some of you subscribe to the, the service that we have. Essentially, it's, it's, it's like a, a cross between Masterclass and Netflix. So it's masterclass training for everything related to the energy sector. We have something like 70 courses on the platform already. We'll have probably 100 by Q1 next year. You pay one price, you can access the entire catalog. Um, it's all on demand. It's got a nifty tech stack. You have access to you know all of these tools. Um, well, let me play a little video here. I'll play for just a couple minutes because you'll see a familiar face pop up here in a minute. But um, the idea is you can, and we have these cohorts, so you can structure, have structured learning with groups, you can schedule it, you can, you have access to all the instructors that are contributing to this. So the, the instructors that uh, we use in Saga are independent contractors, but they're incentivized to provide support to, uh, directly to the, the subscribers. We, they're uh, rewarded um, uh, by royalties, and I'm one of the instructors that provides uh, um, 
obviously materials on here. I have an RTA course on here. Matthias has a multi-phase RTA uh, course on here. This, here's an example of it right there. So there, are, it's mostly video-based lectures. Um, everything's transcribed. Um, everything's accessible. Uh, you can do search searches. There's an AI in there. It'll be answer sort of any question that's based on the content in there. And um, so some pretty slick stuff. Um, here's a few courses that uh, might be relevant to Whitson Plus subscribers that uh, are on our platform. Two RTA courses. There's type type well fundamental or type well curve fundamentals course, and uh, of course DFIT interpretation course as well. So having said that, um, you know what's next? Um, is there going to be resurgence in the natural gas market? Who knows? Digi digitalization is obviously a huge thing. We're moving more towards like uh, these automated models and machine learning and data analytics. Are they going to replace? You know, physics-based, probably not, but they're certainly going to complement them. Um, well performance analysis by AI, I think we're already starting to do that. Uh, reservoir engineering will continue to evolve to fit the needs of the industry, but as I, as I said before, fundamentals will always be important, so let's not forget about uh, the importance of fundamentals. And with that, I'll say thank you very much. I don't know if there's going to be any questions, but probably not. But <laughs> Yeah, because of time, we have yeah. to. If you have questions, he's, uh, he'll be at the happy hour. Uh, uh, the... <laughs> From you know, Dave mentioned a well with uh, seven eight years of uh, of uh, linear flow. Uh, the next guy uh, on the block, Elliot Hoff, he's going to introduce the Mike uh, Fetkovich Technology Award that's later going to be handed over uh, by Eddie Fetkovich. Um, he, I, I think you showed me a well that one time had like eighteen or nineteen years of of uh, B factor equal to to uh, to two in the Bakken. So uh, with that, give the stage to you, Elliot. Yeah, that was a that was a Bakken well. Uh, it's happened to everybody, I guess, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Elliot Huff, and I had a a long career with uh, Heritage Phillips, and then we merged with Conoco, became Conoco Phillips, and so I was uh, came in at a time when I was lucky enough that Mike Fekovich was still working, and uh, and so all of us reservoir engineers at that time, you know, Mike was was a god to us, and. Uh, it was good to have somebody like that in your company that you know you could always uh, look up to and, and and get guidance and call them on the phone. Um, and there was uh, two things that uh, he would always, if you called him on the phone and and, and cold call him. The first thing was, uh, did you plot the data log log? And <laughs> the second was, did you plot it Cartesian? Because what he wanted was trying to get a feel for it. Did did you QC the data? And did you get an understanding of the data uh, in terms of what what regimes it was in? Was it in transient flow? Was it in depletion? That kind of thing. So this award, uh, and I'm glad that Whitson revived this because this was an award that was given out at, at Heritage Phillips uh, starting back in the early 90s. And then with the merger of Conoco, it went on for a couple of years, but then I think it kind of died away. And I was really happy to see that Whitson has kind of revived this award. Now, in this uh, day and age, and a lot of you, you know, we all regard ourselves as scientists, but we've, if you're like me, you've been shocked at how um, the concept of what science is has been perverted over the, ever since the advent of climate change. And then with the pandemic, uh, it was like you were, you were intimidated to follow a narrative uh, so to follow the science was you don't really question the science, you just follow it. It's kind of like it's not science, it's dogma. But Mike, um, he displayed that, that a lot of you that have presented papers that have that same feeling, uh, same sense, is that um, you want to challenge the science, you want to pull real data and see how well it fits the theory that, that you've learned, and then you want to use real data to advance that science and come up with new techniques to better understand what's going on within, within in our case, reservoirs. So a little bit about Mike's bio, uh, born in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania back in 1933. Um, he was affiliated and he was an employee of Phillips Petroleum and then ConocoPhillips basically for his entire career. Uh, he unfortunately passed away in, uh, at the age of 86 right at the beginning of the pandemic back in february of 2020 uh, he married his, his true love uh, emily uh back in 1954 unfortunately she passed away preceding mike back in year 2000 um they had four children um laura michael 
Is is Mick here today? He was supposed to come, but anyway, Eddie's here today to to hand out the award, and then uh, Kit. Uh, they had thirteen grandchildren, and then two great grandchildren prior to his passing, and since then they've had four more uh, grandchildren. Uh, now, Mike, he lived a, a life with a lot of intensity, and his passions were kind of in this order: friends, faith, fishing and football <laughs> and he was a big you know came from the pittsburgh area so al quip if you don't know it's it's northwest of uh pittsburgh i don't know how many miles eddie maybe 20 miles anyway big pittsburgh steelers fan um what what was mike's path to becoming basically a legend in reservoir engineering uh he graduated from the university of pittsburgh with a uh, bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering uh, and then he had a long career. Uh, and over the next 35 years, he wrote at least 16 kind of groundbreaking papers. Um, earlier in his career, back in the 60s, he was, and I'll talk, I have a slide that talks about this, but he attended a two week pressure transient course in, at Stanford taught by Henry Ramey. And that really inspired Mike, uh, the whole field of pressure transient. And, you know, Mike, if, if you've seen all his work, it's really more focused on rate transient and rate time data than it is pressure data. And it kind of makes sense because when you do a, a well test with, and you're looking to measure the pressure decline, um, I'm sorry, I keep walking away from the mic, but uh, you're looking at a 24 hour test or a 48 hour test. Whereas rate time data, you're looking at, you know, five years, 10 years, whatever the, the duration of your well has been on production. So it's a lot more complete understanding what's going on with your well. So the four basic areas that Mike focused on, water influx, inflow performance, decline curve analysis, analysis and layered reservoirs. Uh, in my mind, the most uh, important one that he worked on was the last one, which was layered no cross flow performance. Because... Um, and it applies to unconventional just like it applies to conventional because almost every reservoir you deal with has a, uh, uh, a, a two perm system connected to it. You've got a high perm system, you've got a low perm system. And if you haven't read that paper, I would advise you to go and read it. And every I've read it multiple times and every time I read it, I learn something new. Uh, industry recognized expert, Mike was elected to the National Academy of Engineers in 2005. Uh, he was a distinguished member of SBE, and they awarded him with the Anthony F. Lucas Gold Medal in 1999, which is SBE's most is their major technical award. Uh, the Lester C. Urin, did I pronounce that right? Urin award in 1993, the Reservoir Description and Dynamics Award in 1989, and Mike was also a distinguished lecturer for SBE for many years. Now, one of the things that Mike, a couple of things Mike had to overcome was, you know, his childhood growing up in the ear of the Dust Bowl. Yeah, I think uh, years old. Yeah, but it's. Last <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one, train of thought. Yeah, so he, uh, you know, uh, he, what does it say here? He he would walk nearly a mile to the nearby bus station. He would take a bus five miles to the train station, uh, take a train 20 miles to Pittsburgh, and then walk another mile to the University of Pittsburgh, and then go home the same way. Um, he worked uh, during his spring break and, and time off from school uh, in the steel mills to uh, to basically earn money. Along with that, Mike grew up and he had a, a, he had a very – obvious stutter in the way he he spoke in, especially in public and even when you had private conversations with him um uh, when he started interviewing once he was going to graduate from school i mean uh some of the companies once they heard him talk they kind of pulled back uh and he kept all those rejection letters but one company phillips you know they they saw back past the problem because they didn't see that as a problem that didn't have a solution so when he went to work for phillips you know, they got him in, in speech therapy and and um, things like that. He became uh, he went on a circuit of basically giving presentations, and basically that became his job is presenting his work to young engineers. Uh, he still had a little bit of the stutter, but you could always get the point across. Or he could always get the point across, and you could understand what he was saying. Now, having said that, 
Mike's personality is a little bit serious when you meet him, or when you met him, I should say. But uh, and he was very intimidating, or he could be intimidating. And I'll never forget there was a one of the annual SPE meetings. He was presenting. I forget which paper it was, but there was a young engineer in the audience that got up and asked him a question, and he didn't quite understand Mike's answer. So he rephrased the question and asked it again, and he didn't understand Mike's question or answer again. Uh, by the third time, Mike just turned to him and he said, "Well, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you." <laughs> Did this sound? Is this set up to work? Okay, this is all silent, but there's a there's a audio with this. But this is uh, this is Mike Fekovich, and he's presenting one of his decline curve analysis courses. I think it's at at uh, ConocoPhillips. Now, I mentioned that uh, uh, Mike was inspired by Henry Ramey, who was the, uh, the head of the Reservoir Engineering Department at Stanford. And this slide represents um, basically the, uh, I call it the Stanford Mafia. These were all grad students that uh, were being advised by Ramey, uh, Greengarten, Raghavan, Sinclair, and Wattberger. Uh, they all had unique contributions to a lot of the work that we still use today, and this was all applied to conventional reservoirs, but it's just as applicable to unconventional. So Greengarten and Raghavan developed the uh, the infinite conductivity uh, type curve, and this is these are all this work is done for fractured wells. So for vertically vertical wells that weren't fractured, all that work was actually done back in the 30s uh, using a line source solution and. Uh, it, for a constant rate and then for constant pressure was uh, um, more shiltheous and and uh, in fact that that type curve that those guys built in like 1933 or 1935 is is the type curve that Mike used to develop the analytical solution to his famous Mike Vekovich type curve which is anyway it's this uh, this type curve here so what I did with this, I'm just going to introduce a little bit of the stuff that Mike would always talk about, just to give you a, f a flavor. Just give you a flavor. Um, I highlighted the RE, uh, RE over RW uh, depletion stem uh, in green. Uh, and the way Mike developed that, the analytical portion of the type curve, is he, he shifted all the depletion stems to one common depletion stem. And so and then you see the beginning of all those curves. Uh, for different values of RE over RW at the beginning, but the the RE over RW of 10, uh, if you if you look at a vertically fractured well, that's equivalent to an XC over X of F of five, and so I've got a slide that shows that same curve on a, a vertically fractured well. Um, the yellow shaded region was his original type curve. This was before he did his layered reservoir cross flow work. Uh, so we had B values ranging from 0 to 0.5, and those are all for a single layer system. Uh, as, the in, as the B value increases, you're going from a, a, fair, a almost incompressible fluid with constant viscosity to more and more compressible fluids with viscosity changing as a function of pressure. So oil, oil typically had a B value of 0.3 or 0.33, whereas gas reservoirs in depletion would have a B value of 0.5. And then with his layered no claustro, he explained how you can go from a B value of 0.5 all the way up to a B value of 1 by having a con two layers in communication with the well bore, one layer very low perm and the other one very high perm, or a very a, a noticeable different contrast in permeability between the two. Uh, the blue arrow here, uh, to show you where we are in unconventional, with the RE over RW of 10, um, that, that's a typo over there, but that, say, one year is really off the scale of this plot, and you go out 30 years, and this is a dimensionless type curve, so when you put time in terms of dimension by applying a permeability to it, um, if you're in a 2 nanodarcy range reservoir, uh, you're off this plot, and you at 30 years, you're just barely getting into depletion for a single vertically fractured well. And the way you control getting into depletion in an unconventional case is shortening the space in between fractures. This was Mike's probably, in every lecture I've sat through that Mike was giving, this was like his favorite type curve, which was the Locke and Sawyer type curve, came out in 1975. 
uh, it was for vertically fractured wells. Vertical wells fractured. Can't say that, but um, again, the the green curve is uh, equivalent to an RE over RW of ten. In this case, it's an XE over X of F of five. Uh, and you see the uh, the linear flow region in transition to uh, electrical flow around the fractures into full radio flow before it goes into boundary dominated flow depending on the dimensions of the reservoir. So putting that in, in from dimensionless terms into real terms, I ran this model probably back in 2009 because it was based on some Barnett work that I was working on. But using a, a permeability of 1.5 micro Darcy's, uh, fracture half length of 150 feet and 10 fractures, uh, you can see the period to the end of linear flow is at about 10 days with that kind of permeability. So when you see wells that are in linear flow for 10 years, you know that to get the model, to get a numerical model to predict that long, you have to have uh, uh, permeability is much lower than 1.5 Mark and Darcy's. And you have to have more surface area to explain the same level of magnitude of rate. So Mike, Mike the name Fekovich uh, is forever, in my opinion, and hopefully will carry on this tradition, but forever in the minds uh, of petroleum engineers that practice around the world. Uh, today's award winner, and I, I know him, I've met him when he was working back at uh, ConocoPhillips. I won't mention his name, I'll let Eddie do that, but uh, he shares that same approach to reservoir engineering that Mike did, has that same passion to not only challenge the science, but to advance it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eddie. And just a little brief introduction about Eddie. Uh, he went to uh, uh, OSU. Uh, he's Mike's second son. Mick is the older brother. Uh, he got a degree in mechanical engineering, just like me. So I have a lot of respect for that. Uh, and he had a fairly long career with Phillips before, I don't know what year you left at ConocoPhillips, but uh, he went on to work at uh, Simrex because he wanted to live in Tulsa near near his hometown of Bartlesville, I guess, was the main reason, right? I think the only thing I would add, that was a great description of, of Dad. The only thing I would add to that was he was a prolific reader and everything reservoir engineering related up until just a few months before he passed. Uh, if you want to see him light up, you could see him. If he found a paper that he really believed in, he would call my brother, he'd call me, he'd want us to read him, report back on what we thought. And he would just smile and light up. I mean, reservoir engineering was his life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm real happy with Curtis for continuing to make him known to the practicing generation. So um, when, when Curtis contacted me about uh, presenting the award, I asked him to share some background information on the recipient. And he sent me a number of papers and some links. And I read through uh, all of those. And as I read them, I was like, oh, yeah, I understand why this person's receiving the award. Uh, the papers are very detailed. They're very good at crediting prior work, and they're very easy to understand. And um, with that, I don't want to belabor anymore. This year's recipient of the Mike Fetkovich Award is Mr. Christopher Clarkson, professor at University of Calgary. So Chris, if you'd come up. And, and, and the plaque reads, uh, uh, 2024, Christopher Clarkson, rate time analysis methods in tight, unconventional resources, improving the accuracy and certainty of petroleum resource determination and production forecasting, Whitson. So this is a very deserved, very impressed with, with your work. So, Chris? Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say this is a, an immense honor for me uh, to, to win an award named after one of my heroes. Uh, yeah, it doesn't get any better than that, really, as a, as a professional engineer. Um, just uh, as I was coming up here, I was trying to scrambling to think of how can I express how important Mike's work has been for me. And I have a little bit of a story I'll tell, if you don't mind, just very brief, I promise. Um, I want to tie it back to Whitson and the connection there. Uh, so as a, a young engineer starting out, I wasn't much after Dave. I think it was like two years after you, Dave, uh, starting in the industry. Um, I came out right out of school and I was given a kind of an interesting uh, assignment. I worked uh, the coal bed methane reservoirs, San Juan Basin, New Mexico. And, uh, you know, this really strange reservoirs, right? And, and uh, 
we had an, an engineering advisor on our team said, hey, look, Chris, you know, you got this PhD, buddy, but, you know, you've been focused mostly on chemical engineering because that's that was really what my grad work was focused on. He said, you really have to learn petroleum engineering. And so the fir first thing he did was he took a book off of his shelf, dropped it on my desk and said, this uh, book by Golan and Whitson, you need to read it from start to finish, learn everything in there, and then figure out how this is going to apply to the reservoirs that you're working on right now. Okay, so minor challenge, right? And so I did that. And uh, another one of these wonderfully written books, obviously by passionate authors. Uh, but one of the most important things in that book uh, was uh, the highlight of the work of Mike, uh, Mike Fetkovich and in, in the development of his type curves. Uh, the application of the type curve. So the what I loved about Mike's work, uh, continue to love about Mike's work, is this idea that you can be technically very, very sound, um, and, but it's always got to be practical. There's always got to be a use for it. And that came through in every bit of work that I've ever read from him. Um, and not just the type curve work, which is fabulous, of course, but, but uh, you know, Elliot mentioned the, the multi-layer, no crossbow reservoir paper. Yes, you absolutely have to read that paper. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing piece of work. Applied those concepts uh, to several different reservoirs that, uh, that we worked on over the years. Uh, derivation of rel perm curves. Uh, that was a, another nice, uh, nice paper and, and various inflow performance papers that he's uh, he's written over the years. Uh, so getting back to this idea of coal bed methane, um, one of the things I wanted to do was say, okay, I can I can apply this to these challenging reservoirs, starting with coal bed methane. Um, we had a, a Fetkovich type curve patch to Aries at the time, and we were using it for tight gas wells in the basin, but couldn't make it work for coal reservoirs. You coal, you get this negative incline, negative decline, I should say. Uh, and it just, it you know, how do you make it work for that? So that drove me to like start to make some corrections, try to figure out how we can use these wonderful concepts that had been previously introduced how to make it work for us. And that really drove uh, my early career was this idea of, of trying to make these classical reservoir engineering techniques work. And, and we're seeing that today. Obviously, this conference today is, is a highlight of that, uh, taking these, these classical concepts and making them work for the very challenging reservoirs that we deal with today, the very challenging well geometries, um, and, and trying to make that work. And that's really what drove me uh, in, in my career. And, and I thank Mike for that. I thank all those great uh, engineers that Dave had highlighted in his presentation, obviously, uh, Raj Raghavan and, and uh, others like that, Ramey and, and, um, and company. Those, those are my heroes. And uh, as I said, this, mean, this award means a lot to me because it's named after one of those heroes. And, and I really appreciate it. And thank you so much uh, to Whitson for this. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to round off with a, um, a panel. So if I can ask the panelists to take a seat in the couch. Uh, can also we get the mics? If you can bring the mics up as well, just two of the mics. And that's the last thing today before um, it's uh, over to happy hour. <laughs> yeah, we're actually not that bad uh, delayed as I thought. So uh, just a half an hour with, uh, with me. So that should be good. Um, Craig is going to introduce the, the panel, but it's about mental models and how we use it and incorporate it in uh, the RTA piece. Uh, I'm going to introduce the slide. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so I'll first uh, introduce the, everybody knows uh, these uh, gentlemen. It's uh, Craig from Hess, Orkan from, from Now Quantum, Vivek from, from uh, Oxy, and also Ali from, from uh, Chevron. And uh, I, I consider them experts on the matter, and hopefully they'll, uh, they'll bring uh, forward some controversy. We'll see. Uh, just to set the stage, Craig will mention a couple of words about how mental models have been uh, developing over the last, I guess, uh, uh, 50 years. So we Thanks for the, the intro here. Uh, so this is kind of a composite slide that the, the group put together, and I got elected to talk about it because uh, they figured I was actually working during some of these times. So some of the panelists may not have actually been working. But we kind of put this together to, to kind of give a, a brief historical overview using some actual, you know, starting with the classical era, what we're going to call that, um, of how 
hydraulic fracturing models, reservoir models, mental models have evolved. And, you know, you know, I'm going to start with 1980. And, uh, you know, back what we're going to call the classical era. And that's the time we were drilling a lot of vertical wells. It was kind of the, the beginning of the, the, the tight gas boom. Um, and it's, it's back in the days of, you know, pretty much planar fractures. In the early 80s, we had very little hydraulic fracture modeling available, and that kind of developed. But it's also a, a time when we were doing a lot of science. But we were doing those, that science on vertical wells. So you could actually do a, a pre-frac and a post-frac pressure buildup test. So in, in the RTA audience here, we don't think about pressure transient testing, but we did that back in the 80s and the 90s. And some of those learnings get lost because now we're in the, the unconventional era. So, so, But then we, we quickly graduated to what I'm going to call the dark ages, um, kind of the beginning of shale. And the beginning of shale was, well, everything's complicated. We don't have any models. We're going to basically, you know, for sure, frack models. Let's put it that way. And, you know, we're going to basically do everything in spreadsheets and get better and faster, and we're going to do it that way. And, and a lot of that was caused by some of our, caused, I say, by our early diagnostics, which is microseismic. Um, and then we get to, now we're going to say the high Middle Ages. We're getting a little smarter. We're using microseismic, which is our best tool at the time to kind of understand hydraulic fracturing. And we, we start to enter the age of SRV. Um, you know, every, the, the fracks are complex, but the models start to evolve. So everybody likes to see a complex branching fracture, interaction with natural fractures. A lot of effort goes into that. And it also goes into developing not just fracture models, but RTE models that 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 will start to represent that the you know, trilinear models, various types of models in in RTA, but everything's still relatively homogeneous. Then we start to get more and more data, and start to maybe enter what we're going to call the late Middle Ages, and I start to get fiber data, kind of the age of fiber, and what we start to see there is more planar type behavior and. Now, fracks go from really, everything's complex, now everything becomes more planar, our fracture models. You don't see a lot of complex fracture models presented these days. Um, we stopped using them about five years ago. Nothing, that's not a, a condemnation, it's just that the planar models seem to work. And then we go, you know, forward in time to where, what we're going to call the modern era, which maybe started in 2019, where we start to get a lot more advanced diagnostics. You start to go back and core through hydraulic fractures, which we actually did in the 80s, but we did it again here. Now it's horizontal wells. We start to measure drainage, which you've seen some of those, those papers. Um, we start to have more advanced hydraulic fracture models and much more advanced RTA models. So that's kind of where we are now, but there's still a lot of debate of you know, what's the best mental model? Do we need multiple mental models? And that's, I think, what the panel is going to talk about and what uh, Matthias is going to tease us with questions with. So, thanks. Great. So, we're going to go through a few questions to the panelists uh, here. And uh, this, uh, you know, the dark ages, that's kind of a new term for me. So, I'm going to pass that question to you, Orkan. Uh, you know, can you kind of explain it in easy terms for the room here? And also, what was the milestones, kind of breakthroughs that, that got us away from these uh, series of dark ages, as it seems like? Yeah. Um, thanks for the introduction, Matthias, and uh, great opening, Craig. Um, I know we are between you and a happy hour, so we'll try to make it entertaining and worthwhile with time. So Dark Ages is actually when I started um, my career on conventionals, and it's the, it's the time where we were breaking um, the ground on the horizontal blowing, and uh, we know that we have things that work from Petco Ridge, from Water Embargo, from ARPS, um, but it wasn't translating to horizontal well. So we had this work well, well RTA, but it was difficult to uh, apply with the horizontals. Also, we wouldn't know um, how the fractures grow. Um, and then um, we had a lot of consulting firms, software companies, different school of thoughts in academia and commercial space coming up with a race, explaining how the fractures grow. Something looked funny, like in, in, in the works, I mean, the, uh, and it's like when you see there are two branches, and that's where the mental model come to play. And I'll just keep it short in regard to um, why mental models matter. Mental models are good because 
there are only two direct measurements that we take from reservoir, which is pressure and the rate, and the mental models kind of help us to reconst reconstruct that reservoir and, and give you feedback to, let's say, a completion team or production team, what they did for the execution of the well and then what they can do you know, next to improve that productivity. So milestones will be just consult doing the micro size and a bunch of surveillance to get an idea how the fractures grow, um, and then kind of honing into our model. And uh, Vivek, this is not your first rodeo, uh, so I want to ask the same question to you. Um, you know, from your perspective, when you've been working on on these type of problems for for a long time, what kind of brought you and your mindset out of, of what we call the dark ages of uh, of uh, mental models? Okay, so let me share my story with you on the dark ages. So back in the early unconventional development side. We were making all the decisions based on um, uncalibrated SAC models. So we were making a lot of decisions. And in the meetings, I, you know, I used to go, there would be a lot of heated arguments, a lot of opinions. Uh, but everybody is, they, they, you know, we are all smart technical people, but we had a lot of opinions. Uh, so one day we decided, why, why not do a pressure monitoring role? Why, why don't we understand the drainage height? So what is the real data telling us? So we decided to put like 10 gauges in a brand new vertical wall right into the SRV of the horizontal wall. And this, uh, this uh, horizontal wall is one of the best wall in the permanent basin uh, producing for two years. So we want to understand what makes the world really great. So we did um, decide like to put 10 gauges, but the challenge that we faced was where would be the top and the bottom? So we wanted to come up with the maximum height, uh, range height. And so we had several meetings uh, everybody agreed on, okay, this will be an overkill, so we want to go with that one. So when we actually like drilled the monitoring wall, we got the pressure back, yes, we found that every one of us was wrong. All the gauges were seeing the pollution, and even at the live uh, you know, pressures, we were seeing like all the all the walls, like, all the pressures were seeing drawdowns. So that means we were under predicting our fracture height. So there was like a lot of lessons learned from that one. So we evolved in dark ages. <laughs> we were like having a lot of opinions, but once we got the data, that's when we realized that, okay, um, these hydraulic fractures can surprise us. And for those of you who haven't uh, read actually a lot of the papers coming on, out of Oxy on a lot of those related topics, so I, uh, I uh, encourage you to reach out to Vivek actually mm -hmm. on, on that. Um, you know, related to that, you know, all the, all the different companies have kind of done uh, different internal studies, all of this. Uh, we've also had ConocoPhillips doing, you know, writing kind of a $30 million paper. We've had a hydraulic test sites as uh, well. Um, and these, like, core through type of studies, uh, Ali, have, have they been uh, uh, changing your mental model? Um, and uh, how, what's your experience with that then? Yeah, thank you, Mudia, for that. First, you know, when you look at this lab, I gotta say, I know correlation is not causation, but I start my career kind of in the middle age, and then meaning that a good progress has been there since I start my career. <laughs> so, um, no, point wise, so think about a value factor test side one and two, right? So that was, beside Conical Philip, that was the first time that, that we were drilling a core and drilling a well right through the factors. And we said, okay, let's find out where the propane is going. Are we really generating an, an hydraulic factor in every cluster that we're perforating, although our cluster efficiency is supposed to be very high or we believe is very high. Well, the findings from that tell us that what we, th what we thought we knew versus what we really knew was completely different, right? So, and, and that really changed our mental model. So, so before that, we thought, well, maybe there are some factor shafts that are being created or not. How can we model this? In the RTA, what is the better way to model it? Now, after that, everything changed. Now, we still have the debate, complex versus planar, do we want to do this or that? Factor height is still a problem. I, I agree. I mean, we, we keep, I remember the time where I joined on conventionals and, and the thing was, it doesn't, the bug doesn't matter, we're gonna factor it anyhow and grow. How that changed through time, right? Now it's all about rocks, all about our stresses. Can we confine that stress? Can we really uh, control our factors? High? Can we grow in so or not? You know, trying to maximize our capital. So, so yeah, definitely that's things that we have leverage a lot. Actually, turn that question back to Craig since he, he, he's been working a lot on the same thing. Same topic, you know, cool through studies. There's been a lot of them in a lot of different basins. Uh, I think, you know, speaking from my own experience, I remember when I started in the industry and I saw RTA models, the XFs were extremely small. And I, I think a lot of the cool through st studies have 
have thought of that, okay, we're draining way further away from the well board than we initially thought. And I think like, you know, uh, in kind of the RTA world, things like numerical RTA, et cetera, has, you know, we definitely see a big difference between the analytical models in terms of the half length they, they resolve versus the numerical ones. Uh, what has your experience been on those studies? Um, have they changed your mental model and, and how? So, so let's separate. Um, you can take this. Okay. Okay, we'll see. Yeah, I can only, only speak so okay. um, But when it comes to the core um, you know, we have a little back and forth during the development of this panel on all this. And, you know, there's core threes that you, that you see from the 1980s, okay, of vertical wells. And they show this same, you know, kind of complex planar behavior. Um, in, you know, and then there's the core threes from the HFTS, and one of the striking comments that, that one of the lead people from, not the HFTS, but another core through, their, their major conclusion from their, that was hydraulic fractures are so complicated, we'll never be able to model these things. Um, and that wasn't a very satisfying um, conclusion for me. Um, but, you know, I find the core threes very interesting, but, you know, I told you I'd create a little controversy here. Um, when we put our project together, one of the things that I did not recommend was a core through, because, you know, I... I, I tend to, to do to focus more on the performance of the hydraulic fracture than the fine detail. Um, so, so I think that's that's something that's worth a discussion. Is how much detail do we need to capture? You know, do we need to capture the gross geometry, the 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 the, the details of the productivity, or do we need to count? You know, capture every branch and nook and cranny in the frack, um, which you know, these quotes only sample a small bit. So again, I'm, I'm purposely being controversial here because they're, they're hugely expensive. And, you know, we have to decide what we want to spend our money on. And that was one of the things that, you know, I said, well, we'll spend our money on drainage measurements, not on characterizing fracture geometry, because characterizing drainage was the one thing we were missing the most. We've been characterizing fracture geometry for 30 years, and we're getting pretty good at it. The hard part was characterizing the performance. So. Yes. It is, you know, my I'll just add on that, um, the core truths and HFTS, like before coming to this meeting, I, I was thinking, like, how can I get ready for, for it? And I, I downloaded those HFTS 1 and HFTS 2 reports. There were 400, 800 pages. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to read that. So I uploaded it to a chat GPT and asked, uh, can you summarize this? And then it kept asking questions. <laughs> and just to verify some of my knowledge, uh, one thing I remember, I actually went to a, um, he's, someone who's in his core lab, they, they put the core there and then we were looking at it, it looked all planar. And then we saw finer mesh sand there, which was eye opening because when I started working, we had our own sand mine, Brady sand mine, and then we had all sorts of mesh sizes from 20, 40, 30, 50, 40, 70, 100. And we had this mental model of we got to pump this final mesh at the beginning, and then 40, 70, then 30, 50, 20, 40, and it's going to give the best well. And other companies, not naming the names, are uh, really good ones, already doing 100 mesh on the other side of the, you know, the platform. And as we ran out of the apartment, 2040s and 2050s, everybody had to pump 100 mesh. And then nothing bad happened. The work was still there. And then on top of that, we started pumping damp sand, which is not even dried, and still did fine. We didn't lose. So some of the things that we believed as a um, uh, source of truth and we had conviction. Like if I pumped a well without 2040, uh, it would have been like a terrible job, but it turns out it actually doesn't hurt. So some of those core work actually helped to calibrate the uh, mental models. So I think we can all uh, all agree that uh, our mental model has changed uh, probably drastically uh, in the last few uh, few uh, few years. So if you bring this back into kind of the RTA world, uh, Vivek, you, you've done a lot of work on this. Uh, can you even use like RTA or RTA techniques to you know try to model or understand things like drainage and well spacing, at, uh, et cetera? You know, when, I, when I was discussing about all the science world, um, we had quite a bit of understanding based on impression monitoring worlds and also a lot of micro seismic that we got. Um, we now know that how, how these um, you know, height and XRFs uh, come along. And also, like, you know, we understand kind of the drainage shape. Uh, it's not 
even or rectangular that we normally think on model. It's more like, I think the landing zone has the highest amount of drainage. As you go up and below, you get like reduced efficiency. So how? So when we were thinking about how do we translate all of those things in a, in a regular BSU analysis, it's like, it's pretty expensive to do all these monitoring walls or micro seismic every DSU. But on the flip side, we have 90% of the walls have RTA cases. So we know the SRV size from the RTA. So, and that was the challenge, like, so we have like prolific RTA data, but the geometry is quite simple, like just a rectangular model. Uh, but we have a lot of, you know, deeper science work based on few walls, but how do we integrate those? If, if we could integrate both, then probably we can do a DSU analysis really at the, at the, at the uh, realistic level. So that's what, um, Myself and my um, colleague Surabe, I mean, we just brainstormed quite a bit and, um, and we figured out a way how to link the RTA to the other ones and still get a uh, decent visualization on the DSU connectivity, world by world connectivity. And we were doing that for optimizing all our DSU. So that was a pretty good challenge, but we, we got like something meaningful out of that. And that's a very good paper, by the way. But can you just summarize for the audience here, like what uh, kind of data types you use to calibrate the RTA models? There, there was a lot of different technologies and diagnostics you used in the in the paper. Yeah, pretty much for the drainage height, um, we use uh, monitoring walls and micro seismic. I think they they were pretty much uh, a good representation of the drainage height. Uh, of course, they even counts on the micro seismic, or we were using it for um, for getting that uh, kind of weightage factor. Uh, how much how much away from the landing zone what the event count distribution look like so that was one of the thing uh, so based on that one we were also using the micro micro seismic hydraulic half lens uh, as one more parameter so you have the height and you have the xf from these and then the shape is coming off from the pressure monitoring well drainage shape so that's how we, we were able to like get the shape of for, for the fracture shape uh, Alan, have you been calibrating in models to any field data? Uh, and uh, if so, what, uh, what has it done? For sure. So, first of all, I think RTA providers with the solution of a package together, right? So, our intention is always, okay, let me just put all those pieces separately and then try to plug it as a as a Lego and see if I can just optimize that those, each of those variables. Sometimes that is challenging, but sometimes that is possible. Um, one example is when you go, um, let's say that you're changing the size and you want to change your cluster spacing from one to the other, meaning you're going to put more clusters into one well versus the other, and also you might maintain or not proper and fluid intensity. When you go there, one of the things that you should notice if this is effective is, is a significant change. If you're changing cluster spacing is significant too, a significant change in delta values if you use fractional dimension RTA. That means that you are generating more or less complexity, and that really gives you a very good hint on, hey, is my new design effective? Am I really doing what I'm supposed to do? Because you might be creating more area, but where are you creating that area is also important for well spacing purposes. So, so I believe fractional dimension RTA will allow you to see that possibility. We, we saw it in Macamorta, we see it in DJ. So, so I'm, I'm, I know that it's possible, that, and you know that help that help you give another data point to your uh, completion engineers. Hey guys, doing it this way, you are doing ex, ex seems like you are doing exactly what we're expecting to do. So we can continue now for that. Then you can run economics and believe is that that's worth it or not. Just on that topic, do you ever like calibrate to frac models, or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna get in trouble here. <laughs> so, um, frac models. So when we start, depending on where you are, factor complexity might be important or not. Natural factor nervous might be important or not. In my opinion. If my anisotropy, basically the difference between uh, SH man and SH mean is, is big enough, I will expect more planar factors. If it's not big enough, I will expect my natural factor level to drive more. And that will make me drive my decision on how you want to model my model. How do, I mean, which software I want to model this? I want to model as a planar factors or I want to model as a complex factor network. Obviously, there are two big solutions right now in the in the software industry that I can help you with one versus the other. So that will, that's what I will do, basically. Uh, I, you know, I can't ask that question only to yourself. I have to also ask that to to uh, to Craig. Like, do you have any? What's your what's your what's your key thoughts uh, for for the audience when it comes to frac modeling? Do you have any pet peeves or any things that you yeah? You know, what's your stick on on that piece? Ooh, so it's a different question if you ask me pet peeves. <laughs> well, okay, general pet peeves are when people really really believe frac models 
Okay. And when they won't use them. So the two extremes, and, and we do see see those camps. There will be those that really actually believe all the stuff that comes out of these frack models is, is, is really correct. Now, if those of you that might know me know I'm, I, I love frack models, but um, but it's it, you know the, the key is in the calibration, and that's that's what you're getting at, Ollie, and is is uh, and that's kind of the focus that that we've taken is you know. We, there's there's a lot of of basic physics that are in frack models, just like there is in reservoir models, that can't be ignored. And there's a lot of diagnostics, just like pumping the job. You know, pumping sand is a diagnostic. It tells you the frack is wide enough to take that sand. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're very very simple things. And you know, you know, mass balance and fracturing is, is similar. You know, it it works. It you know, how it's distributed is the key. Um, so, so, so you know, I don't really have a lot of um, model centric, um, you know, comments here because you know I've used various models throughout my, my career. I think it's more how, the, how it's more about the user than it is the model. I haven't found the, the perfect model. The, the the models have evolved a lot, so I think we have much better models now. But even some of the simple models I still still use for kind of scoping work. You know, and those simple models, those simple planar models we had you know, probably in the 90s. <laughs> we'll, we'll still still use them. So it's really the calibration. That's been the focus all along. So so on this piece of like hydraulic fractures, or kind of, why is it so challenging? You know, like what's the challenges of understanding how the fractures look like and how to model it uh, from your perspective? Because we sit, still sit here today, it's 2024, and there's a lot of topics with there's no consensus on, and it seems like there's actually important topics there should be a, a consensus on. Uh, so, what do you think are kind of the main challenges when it comes to understanding these hydraulic fractures? That's a dumb question I've heard in a while. <laughs> so, uh, well, I guess that's why you invited me here. But I, sorry, I don't have an answer. But I'll come back to that. But I want to share something that I think is worth sharing with this group, uh, and that's we talked about calibration techniques or the surveillance in the last two years I've seen uh, time lapse geochemistry rise in popularity. And if you truly believe how they measure that and how they map the, the you know the particular oil fingerprinting to the cuttings, it, it it tells us a lot about the fraction growth. And I've seen companies make multiple dollar decisions on targeting even uh, with that. Now why it's challenging, what are the challenges? And I think technology building or not, like I was working with one vendor and that particular person had a background with tech like IBM and Intel and all. And he was trying to convince me that they need to do a particular test with one of the companies that, you know, we sponsor. And in the end, he frustrated and said that, you know, I work with so many companies, industries, oil and gas is the worst in terms of, um, applying the new technology. Everybody wants to do it themselves. Like, if they tell you that so-and-so did it, they wouldn't believe you. Well, I want to do it myself as well. Uh, but I, do, I think that's a little bit of a prejudice in that regard, is holding us back, uh, that you don't trust. Um, like, if big, larger company did it, I should be doing it too. Now you want to try it yourself. Uh, but in the positive side, though, we have a lot of things where we get out of these dark ages is conferences like this. Like people, I remember, especially in academia, now they'll go to these debates and panel discussions and push each other now. It's survival of the fittest that we don't see all of them today, which is a good thing. Uh, we have the ones that are actually working better, but uh, kind of challenging each other, asking these tough questions that you asked, I think is one way to just get better at it. Yeah, I can take a check. So, so, okay, so thank you. Um, well, back to the question you, you wanted to answer, you want to answer for. <laughs> and, uh, um, why, why is it challenging? In my mind, you know, even just remove unconventional, remove it the factory, while we have trying to solve an inverse problem, we know the solution, we just know the combination, we just don't know the combination of parameters that got us to that solution, that pressure, that rate response. Now we have the factory into it, right? So then, in order to solve this challenge, we typically come and call me acquire some data so that I can help calibrate myself. I'm going to acquire micro seismic fiber, uh, fingerprinting, or, or, or time lapse or chemistry. All that gives you potential solutions. The challenge is that you always can come up and say, well, my factor group is, but I'm learning from here. So there is always what you flag versus what you drain, what is prop versus what's some prop. So 
is, uh, and you can always come and get a very, very good history match with the wrong answer. And it's so easy to get there. And you know, when you do probabilistic history match, you can see the range of outcomes, that the range, the range of incomes that you can put and still get a very good outcome. So, so to me, that's, that's still the challenge. Like, I don't think we have a personal solution and we need to live into that uncertainty and understand, okay, we see these are the potential outcomes and just pass that message to decision makers. Hey, this is the potential outcomes. I, I cannot tell you exactly what is it, just really here and here and they gotta live into that uncertain world too. So, so continue to play a little bit on that. We're in the modern era now, um, you know, with that in your mind, what, what's kind of missing uh, to get us to the next, I don't know what we're going to call the next thing, but it's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> probably some good suggestions here, but uh, what, what, what do you think is missing to get us to the next uh, uh, stage? So, so, so one of the things that we still face the problem is um, what, what should be the world spacing and what should be the completion size associated with world spacing. Um, even though we tend to have a lot of understanding from different data, still there is a little bit of that subjectivity uh, out there. And of, of course, can you just put a bigger job with um, bigger spacing? Is that a, a, a good answer, or it, should we be like you know, having more worlds and less flags? Uh, what 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 is the ideal economic solution? I mean that that one is uh, still a, f a future thing. Uh, we are kind of getting there, but I don't think we are at the very very optimal solution uh, to that one. Just because the hydraulic factors are very complex to understand, and also the other thing that we still don't know is what is the lateral efficiency. Are we making equal number of factors as we are modeling it, you know, like the uniform models? Uh, that is something that is very, very challenging. I mean, because not every world is coming up with the same productivity for the same design, right? So there is obviously something that's missing. So I don't know if it's the lateral efficiency or the number of factors, how these factors overlap with the natural factors. I mean, that, those are things that we don't have a good clue right now, but those will be the economic uh, improvement that we should be expecting in the future. Yeah, I also wanted uh, Craig's take on exactly the same question because you've done a lot of work on this, on, on this but like, you know, whether it's subsurface like RTA, whether it's frac modeling, or whether it's diagnostics, what, you know, what is missing to get us like to the next step? Uh, and what do you feel that we've kind of been really good at the last, uh, the last few years? Well, I, I think we're, we're making a lot of progress with calibrating our models. So I'll get, I'll, I'll get on that, uh, that you know, that's, podium again. Um, but I, I think that the real transformation is going to happen when, when two things, when we get truly predictive models, but then when we, we actually figure out how to make all the fracture area productive. Um, you know, because because that's what we're really missing. You know, anybody you talk to, they're you know, you know, they're going to give you a number less than fifty percent, probably, um, of, of at least the length. That might be much less of the area, right? Um, and it, it's um, you know, I, I sit through these things a lot, and we'll take polls and say, well, what's a you know, what's a creative length? Oh, a thousand feet. What's a productive length? You know, you'll get two hundred feet. You know, maybe now you'll get more than that, but um, and there's just this general acceptance that that's just the way. Fracturing is, you know, we pump all this fluid and profit, and we we, we get a, a very low efficiency. Um, so, so I think that's the transformation. How we get there, you know, we'll we'll take probably a lot more industry experimentation and collaboration. Back to your point, which we we don't have enough of, but um, but I think that that's the you know that's the the big thing that's missing is is how we do that. It was mentioned here that the, the newest, uh, you know, getting larger, larger completions, maybe both fluid and proper pumped. Um, and uh, the, the final question will go to you, Arkan, and it will be another hardball uh, because uh, uh, you're you're a good friend of mine, so I can ask you hard questions. Um, and that's you know, it's bigger. You know, fractures always better, um, and uh, bigger completion is always better. Uh, I guess is my question. Uh, what's your thoughts on on that? Or have we kind of reached a maximum where we probably would like to maybe go go dial it back a little bit? In Texas. Yeah. Well, uh, good thing I thought about it. Uh, so I have I have somewhat uh, okay answer on that. Um, so it's bigger the better. I think in general it's true up until you have reached your economic hurdle, whatever the rate of return that you're trying to achieve is pumping additional. You know, the well, the the uh, pump or barrel there is going to give you more than just throwing a new well and then 
um, uh, and completing as well. And I think I'm a, I'm a huge fan of how you know, small local portfolio companies, feedback companies did it really well. They, because it was their business model, they drew a stand alone well and then put 110 barrel per foot, 5,000 pound per foot. So that, you know, some of you may make fun of it, but in reality, they, they gave us a good data point to know what the world can deliver. It's such a long job. Now, you can't plan the entire development like that, but it's a good point. I need a good data point to have. Now, on the other hand, some of the large companies have spoken to and really good ones who do a lot of technology also said that in a certain place they had this um, kind of fear of uh, remorse or regret where they didn't pump enough. So there are big places at the beginning of the development, it's good to pump big just to see can we break the box, can we see the physical limit and kind of scale back from there. Overall as a business model I think it works better. Uh, than just being um, hesitant on um, on the completion size and then trying to increase later on. It's always better to scale down than scale up, if that makes sense. Otherwise, you'll be doing weak facts. Excellent. So um, that will be the closing statements for today. Give everybody a big applause. Thank you so much. Uh, that's it for today. So just across the street here, Yard House has uh, food and drinks for everybody. So uh, go over there ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the final one. Okay, appreciate it.